beginner futurist and a beginner surfer. So if you have questions, let me know. So just to go over some of the lessons that I've learned in the past three years running a Drupal agency. And I hope that I'm able to tailor this to some of your specific interests in business and or agency life, running an agency or, or being a contractor. I think I've got some lessons here for everyone, but I'm certainly going to leave a little bit of time open for questions at the end. But the things that we're going to go over today are knowing your customer, what is the bottom line, standing on the shoulders of giants, what the hiring costs of running a business actually are, uh, being flexible and agnostic, valuing your time, and then always searching for better and hopefully finding it. So to know your cus customer, we start off businesses with this idea of personas. Personas will rule how we judge who we're going to work with, who we market to. Um, personas are great. Talking to your customers once you've got customers, if you've left an agency with your own client and knowing how they, they treat you and how you're going to treat them, I think that's really important. But also knowing who you don't want to work with is the best. And we found after three years, we finally started dialing in who the clients that we don't want to work with are. And that has been the most healthy thing for our, for our own corporate uh, entity, for our structure, uh, and for our culture. But once again, going back to personas, we all approach business from this, this idea of ready, aim, fire. But rarely are we actually getting ready before we start aiming and then we fire. Usually it is, I have a business idea, I'm going to put it out there, and I'm going to see if the world likes it. And rarely is that the final iteration of what the business will become. So when I talk about ready, aim, fire, I mean, Let's really talk about this idea. Let's, I'm going to go out into the community, do my research, find out if there's actually a business fit. Also to find out if there are other people doing it. Find the right pricing for that product or that service. And then finding possibly the customers and the niche that I will dig into to be able to find people to pay me. And then once you've really done the research, then putting out your business idea and start practicing it. But you're always going to have to iterate back to it. And I will reiterate through this, this conversation that iteration is key to running a business. So I say ready, aim, fire, then ready, and start the process over again. This also contributes to continuous understanding. If you're able to talk to your clients regularly, do exit polls if they're leaving you, do entrance conversations when the client's coming to you, and then in that discovery phase, I think it's super key to get into the details of what they're expecting, what they're hoping to get out of this relationship, not just the project that you're trying to currently solve a problem for, but also from a large business standpoint, what their objective is, what their goal is. Are they trying to sell their business? Are they trying to just hand off some of the work that they're overwhelmed with? All of those are important details to get in the very beginning of a relationship. And then the other part of this knowing your customer is knowing when it's time to let your customer go. And I think that's a, that's a hard lesson and I can give some specific examples without actually telling you who the client was, but this past year we fired clients. And it was the most healthy thing we've ever done as an agency. Um, as a young agency or as a young contractor or somebody that's first starting to get into their professional career, you're scrappy. You're looking for everybody that will pay you money. And you will work as hard as you can and take all the abuse that you can to get that money. And that's, that's perfectly fine. It's normal. But also there comes, comes a time when that is taking too large of a toll on you, your personal relationships, and your life outside of work. So it's super important to start thinking about what that line is. How much of myself am I willing to give this client uh, and or this team or this product? And when should I step away? And for us, that was when we lost a project manager because the client wasn't able to be collaborative enough with that project manager. They were arguing with us about our payments. They were arguing with us about our billing. Uh, they, they kind of put up roadblocks almost every single step of the way during processes and trying to make sure that they were happy. And we realized that wasn't making us happy. And we let that client go. Interestingly enough, we tried to hand them off to another agency. And they showed their true colors to this other agency in that, that brief second conversation. Uh, and that, that second agency decided to not work with them as well. And that's when I kind of understood as a business owner, sometimes even though you can try to make a client better, you can try to work to the client's strengths, sometimes the client is just a bad client. Uh, and it's not your fault. It's as an agency, as a contractor, it's not your fault. So understand when it is time to fire. Now let's talk about bottom line. Money is something that we don't talk about a lot at Drupal camps. And I think it's, we're just going to spend a slide on it. And let's, let's talk about it just really, really quickly. From a business standpoint, if you've ever run a business, you've ever sold lemonade, if you've ever had an Etsy business or an eBay business, 
you have to understand that the amount of money that you're putting into the business has to get you more money in return, otherwise it's not quite worth your time. And so when we talk about the bottom line, we have to factor in a couple of things, the income and expenses. We also have to think about the management and the maintenance of those bookkeeping and, and how you're actually making that money and where that money goes. Uh, and then we need to talk about the goals that you're setting. So realistically, if you're in technology, you realize that working for yourself has its benefits. You get to choose your schedule. You get the opportunity to kind of be flexible in the contracts that you choose and get to do sometimes what you really want to do. But it's less regular. You spend almost as much time on sales as you do actually doing your projects. And that's time to factor into your overall business expense. That time that you're spending on looking for contracts, networking, making connections to be able to get new contracts. That is all a part of the expense category of your time not going directly towards making your money. While as a, an employer, if you've got contractors or employees, you have to factor in not only the cost of having that employee around, but the overhead of all the services, the, the tools that you use to build the things that you need to build, as well as the technology that you're buying for your employees, the conferences that you're attending. All of those little details matter, and at the end of the day, if you're not making money, the business does not make sense. And you can't tell that unless you are doing your own bookkeeping. And of course you can hire somebody to do your books. We all have accountants or tax people that have handled our taxes at the end of the year. But realistically, you need to be having this conversation with yourself monthly, checking in on your books, making sure that your bills, your income, and your expenses make sense. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about your own personal time. But after we set goals, we set a goal to make 15% you know, margin on our, our time overall for the year. Um, you set that goal, and you can start whittling down that, that cost, that overhead, and aim for 20%, aim for 25%. But you can never set a new goal, and you can never reach a goal if you never start with one sim simple goal. Uh, so I, I strongly recommend, if you're not currently having conversations with yourself about finances, just sit down, understand where things are going and where they're coming from, and then start setting goals. I didn't put a meme for this because there are a lot of giant memes, but none were funny. They're all the New York Giants. Uh, look around for inspiration everywhere. Um, I think it's really important as business owners that we think about the, the corollary business models around us. Um, there are so many businesses that are set up to do exactly what we do in the service industry for a different type of vertical. Uh, I learned so much about watching YouTube videos about people that do lawn mowing and landscaping and pressure washing and how to apply that customer service or how to apply that sales tactic to our business. And on top of that, there are a lot of really successful people that really like talking about themselves. So I highly encourage everybody to kind of step out of their shell a little bit and find somebody in your network, your mom's friend, your uncle's neighbor, who has been successful in some kind of service or product industry that might have something to teach you, some lessons they you might be able to glean from. Also, finding community members to, to treat as peers and to bounce hard ideas off of and hard questions. Uh, I think we're all too a little bit shy, and, and most of us work remotely. We work from home. We don't have an opportunity to kind of get in front of people and shake hands and talk a lot besides conferences like this. But I do recommend looking into your own communities and looking into your own work and reaching out to your family and friends and saying, hey, does, does anybody have a recommendation for somebody I can talk to about business or about my product or about my service? Uh, because there, there's probably somebody pretty close to you that can start giving you ideas or at least provide a mirror to bounce some of those difficult ideas off of. Also looking into other industries, uh, it's, it's not a really well-kept secret that we stole Agile from manufacturing. Um, it in, and it has become one of the most important, if not destructive, but most important uh, business processes that we have, or iterative processes, uh, and that was stolen from manufacturing. We can look at other industries and other products and services to, to gain a lot of information. So look around everywhere for inspira inspiration. Um, here's a, here's a, uh, a special a side note. Always delight people and uh, delight your clients or audience. So I have another meme for you. Employees versus contractors. Who am I paying for what? This is another difficult thing that we've learned in the last three years that was, um, it's, it's a lesson that, that had to be learned the hard way. Uh, when do we hire? Do we hire a contractor? Do we hire an employee? Um, does it always make sense to hire an employee? It actually doesn't. Uh, we've had a lot of conversations with other business owners and found that if you have enough uh, incoming work to be able to provide an opportunity for an employee to at least break even, then it might be worth hiring an employee. 
If you have enough leads in the pipeline, six months to a year, and uh, it's just a little bit more work than you can currently handle, then it might not make sense to hire a full-time employee. You should probably think, think about getting a contractor instead. Um, and realistically, that the way that you pay contractors breaks down differently than employees. Sometimes you may have an employee that is not working full-time hours or is not billable all the time, and that's costing your company money. Vice versa, every hour that a contractor spends on working on a project should necessarily be billable, unless it's an internal meeting or something like that for just the company. Uh, so it provides an opportunity to be more profitable with less work, but you're making less margin off of each contractor hour. So there's a balance there that you have to, to ask yourself what makes sense from a business standpoint. Uh, and we found that kind of soft, slow rule to be that if you've got enough work for six months uh, to be able to, to keep somebody at break even, it makes sense to hire a full-time employee. How much should you pay people? This is also a difficult question because we want to be competitive towards the market. We also want to retain employees and contractors. We want to make sure that they feel, they feel accomplished working with us and that they're happy to work with us. Uh, and so Daggerheart Lab has done some interesting things. We've tried, uh, tried a couple of risque things, but the reality is our, our general rule is we try not to negotiate too hard. We want to make sure that somebody that comes to the company as a contractor um, has the, the freedom to tell us what they think that they're worth. And if they're giving us an astronomical number, it may not work out. Um, if they're valued at, if they're valuing on themselves what we value our other developers and they show you know, the potential to, to be the fit for that role that we're looking for, uh, then we're not going to argue with them too much if it's too far off of what we're, or if it's not too far from where we're currently paying employees or contractors, I should say. Um, so negotiation is, is a difficult thing. We don't want to, as a business, you know, overextend ourselves and try to go too far and let somebody you know, ask us for a lot of money. But realistically, we have to kind of stay within the boundaries of what we're used to paying people. When it comes to employees, uh, we try to structure, and we're still in experimental phase with this, but we try to structure of uh, three different tiers where uh, a person that gets told what to do makes 75000 a year, a person that does gets 100000 a year, and a person that tells other people what to do gets 125000 a year. And we felt that putting our, our pay structures into tiers enabled us to get rid of some of those awkward conversations about people working next to somebody else and saying, they make more than, more than me, but I'm more experienced, or they make more than me, and I do more. Um, we also wanted to take the, the concept of bias around any kind of identifier out of the conversation and make sure that everybody was paid equally uh, based on the work that they did and the type of work that we valued them for. Uh, and obviously that includes benefits and time off and things like that. We're still experimenting. It feels good so far. It feels fair and nobody at the company has complained about it. Um, but this is only year three, so I'll, I'll update you maybe next year of year four uh, being a Drupal agency. Um, so, when, I hope there's, is there any questions specifically about this one? When should I hire a contractor or employee? Yeah, so, I mean, so I guess there's like that flexibility with the contractor mm -hmm. that is, has a lot of appeal. Mm -hmm. um, and then also like just, just being able to know like, you know, I'm going to have this margin on it and it's, you know, it's it's like a guarantee. It's it, guaranteed. It's a super sure bet. Um, but you're you're saying, I guess you were saying, you know, that that like six months out is, mm -hmm. is enough of a cushion to make it make it comfortable. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of a standard or just something you guys? That's that's what we're currently feeling out. Okay. Um, I think realistically, the industry standard is probably uh, less. So, like, if we're looking at big corporate America. Uh, they would probably only guarantee income for two months before they you know, were able to hire full time. And that's because usually the marketing machine is churning, that they have leads, they know for, uh, for a fact statistically they're going to get this amount of leads per year. Uh, and they're just trying to hit numbers for their investors. Um, for a small, very small company, I'd probably say they, they, you know, when we started we wanted to have a year's salary in the bank before we hired someone for a year. Uh, for a full-time contract, for the first one. and I think that was a little too conservative. Um, so finding that that middle ground that's comfortable for you, but also being aggressive towards uh, towards growth, and maybe being a little bit just a little bit calloused in the understanding that if I have to let somebody go, I will. I don't want to, but if I have to, I will. Um, that's a difficult place to be in as a business owner because you want to be equitable and fair and sustainable for a long term and. You know, realistically, we all want to create the companies that people can retire in. 
uh, that is just not the reality of how companies work. So I think finding that, that balance of what you feel good about at the end of the night, you can go to sleep, you know, not dreaming bad dreams about having fired somebody. Um, I think that's the, the main point. But contractors having the ability to be flexible, we're, in a current, we're currently in a situation where we've offered our contractors that are working 20 hours per, per week for us, we've offered them full-time jobs and they're not interested because they're getting paid a little bit more than the, the salary would permit, but they have the flexibility to go off for you know, a day and a half on Friday, uh, on Thursday and Friday to go camping or hiking or whatever. Uh, and they love that flexibility. So it's a trade-off, it's a balance. How hard it is resourcing when you're also working through like contractors versus employees and trying to prioritize what needs are coming your way? The beautiful thing about contractors is it's not even a, uh, an issue of right to work, but it is also, it's just a, do I as an owner or a project manager or a, a salesperson want to resource that person if they're not able to be transparent and have conversations with us regularly about their availability and be reactive and proactive about communication? Um, luckily, we haven't run into people that are, that are not going to communicate with us two weeks in advance when they're going to go on a, a camping or fishing trip. Um, but that is the, the true encouragement, like creating a conversation about what do you want to do this summer? Do you want to hang out with your family? We'd be happy for you to go off for three weeks, uh, go h hike the, the CDT. Whatever you want to do, we're happy to make that happen. Just tell us. Just let us know in advance. And, and that's always been a really good boon to our, our communication and culture. Yeah. Yeah, the only downside to that contractor thing is when you have an urgent request mm. and not available like a normal employee would be, mm -hmm. that's a bit of a downside to contractors, but I, I totally get what you're saying. Totally. Redundancy is another main point of that, right? If you've got enough people in the company that have their hands in that cookie jar too of that, that same client, then finding some redundancy. And, and I think. That's a difficult lesson that we could have put up here. Thanks for bringing that up. Usually, uh, in a small agency like this, a lot of those responsibilities of kind of being the reference and the dictionary for all projects falls onto one or two people. And currently, that is Jonathan Daggerhart of Name Saying Daggerhart. <laughs> so if, if you know, one of our contractors needs to step away, we can bring him to a briefing and, and get him spun up again. But yeah, finding some redundancy to be able to, to plug those holes when somebody does leave, that's super hard. And it's a cultural problem that I've heard talked about in agencies for decades now. Nobody's really come up with a hot swappable option, right? We can't just hot swap somebody in in a day. It's going to take a couple weeks to get onboarded unless somebody has kind of hovered over that project to understand what's going on. But yeah, that is an issue, totally. All right. Speaking of being flexible, I love this meme. Flexibility, you mean the ability to flex? So stop, thing, stop doing things just because you know you can. Um, this, is a, this is a business, a, a huge problem in most businesses. And the larger that a company gets, the more difficult it is for that business to pivot away from bad practices. And that usually talks to the culture of the company. If you're unable to talk about the problems, if you're unable to discuss what might be new and interesting and exciting, and then unable to implement those possible exciting changes, then the business is doomed to stagnate. And you're going to lose people, uh, you know, contractors and employees, you're going to le lose good management, and you're going to lose clients. And I think the, the one of the big lessons that we've learned is that if we have just an inkling, an idea of what we're actually doing, we've written it down, we've talked about it a little bit as a group of people that actually have to follow that procedure, um, then we're able to iter on, iterate on it a lot faster. And so starting off to to the idea of being flexible means just adding a little bit of skeleton. You know, we want to have some understanding and idea, and we call that SOP, a standard, data, standard operating procedure. And it's so much easier to do than most people understand. You just, if you're going to do something more than once, write it down, just take, jot some notes, understand what you're going to do, have somebody watch you and ask them to write some notes as you're doing it. Um, then you can come back the second time you have to do it. And you can update those notes. And you can look for opportunities to make it more efficient. You can look for opportunities where people get stuck or people have problems. And I'm not just talking about you know, the DevOps setting up a new uh, Drupal site, setting up an environment. I'm talking about how we do payroll, how you uh, pay people, how you do booking and uh, starting your discovery conversations, your initial handoff documents. All of these things, if you're going to do it more than once, it's worth having a, a little bit of an understanding of, 
uh, how to write that down, writing it down, and then coming back to those processes. The value is not just in being able to iterate really quickly away from that and say, okay, well, we know the dependencies for this one process all lie outside of this one SOP. It's also, it goes further into being able to onboard somebody else into that process as a business owner, handing off responsibility to somebody else to take on quickly. As a developer, being able to get as close as possible to hot swapping in somebody to a project. Um, as, you know, as you're onboarding a new project manager, giving them all the keys to the castle, that all becomes a lot easier. But realistically, if you go even further into the idea of SOPs and being flexible around your business structure and it's documented well, we can talk about selling your business. If there's an opportunity to merge or sell your business in the future, having that SOP is actually what another company is going to be buying. That's the main asset of the company, is not just the product of the machine, but the machine itself and how well it's documented. So I can't recommend that highly enough. Being well documented, that gives you that a flexibility to be able to change your process very quickly uh, on, a, on a moment's notice. Um, and then allows you to just come back and decide to do something just a little bit differently this time. Let's document that change. Let's see if it works better. Uh, I think that's super important. Valuing your time. This is something that we've learned the hard way as well, is that sometimes the business things that we do, the sales, the, the um, discovery conversations, the estimation conversations, the initial audits we're doing with clients, or even correcting the issues that our developers bring up for our clients, all of that we're not necessarily told to get paid for. We think as developers we want to jump into a, a conversation, then we want to have a problem, and when we're solving that problem, we'll get paid for that. That's the time that we will get paid for, is bringing a technical solution to solve a business problem. But the reality is, every part of the conversation that you're having with the client, that you're giving expertise, understanding, or, or helping them through that business process, you're providing value to them, they should be paying you for that value. Uh, I just had a, a conversation with another business owner recently who talked about working with his team. His team is mostly junior developers and he spends a lot of his time cleaning up the code for them. He also told me that his hourly rate was really low. We're talking $80 per hour. And that he himself as an agency owner was unable to get to that $100,000 per year in his personal income. And we're looking at a couple of problems here. Firstly, he's got developers that he's having to correct and he's not creating enough margin on his hourly rate of $80 to factor in his own time. Secondly, he's not billing for his own time in being able to correct those, those hour, or to correct those problems from his other developers. So from two different aspects, he is underselling himself. He is not valuing his time, and he's not allowing the customer to actually pay him for the, all the work that he's doing. So he's not able to get to those goals. He set his goal of getting $100,000 per year. Turns out with that workflow, he's only making about $60,000 a year. And that's difficult to hear, but it's completely understandable. We feel responsible for the code that gets put out by our companies. We also don't want to stretch the clients to a place that they feel like they're paying too much per hour. Well, once again, we go back to the very beginning. Might not be the right client fit for you. If they're unwilling to pay for those extra hours that you're managing your other developers, or they're not willing to pay a higher hour to be able to ensure the quality of those hours is high, they might not be the right client for you. So I highly recommend that you take a look at all the other business aspects that you are performing for your, yourself, your business, your company, and look at how much time you're spending on that that you might not be getting paid for. Are those conferences that you're going to, is that fueling your work? Is the, the amount of research that you're doing at the end of the night that you're playing with a new toy or you're playing with a new piece of code? Does that actually affect your business performance? And if so, you should talk to somebody about that. You should either get paid for that or you should, you should be proud of that and show it off because in your business, you might get an opportunity to do more of that. So valuing your time is, is super important. And lastly, oh, we can't read that at all. Uh, saying no to letting your responsibilities and clients take 100% of your mental health saying yes to creating a safe environment for talented people and clients to feel like they can accomplish anything while saving your energy for important problems and your personal life. Let's create better relationships. As people are part of businesses and as business owners, uh, let's create better relationships not only with our peers, our, our fellow contractors and developers, but let's make sure that our relationship with our clients is really good. Let's make sure that our relationships with our, ourselves and our families and our everybody outside of our work is good. Um, and to do that, I think transparency is the key to why Daggerheart Lab has, has 
been some, somewhat sustainable. Sustainable. We've created transparency in our client relationships, telling them when we feel uncomfortable doing something, telling them when we're super experienced and excited to do something, talking about money with our employees and contractors, being able to tell people you know, how much money we have in the account to be able to show them sustainability, and also tell, talking about what stresses us out. Uh, I think being able to be transparent allows everybody in the room to take a deep breath because the sales cycle takes so much out of everybody. But then being able to say, okay, well, we're really excited to do this. We don't think this is the right move for you from a business standpoint, or we don't think this is the, the top priority to make you the value that you're looking for. Um, that allows us to, to really just execute and then bring back results to our clients. Um, and that will get us better clients. Realistically, going back to the very beginning, the clients that we get to work with, we have to feel grateful for. Uh, we have to be in a place of gratitude for every client that gives us money to do something hard. And if you have a toxic relationship, if you feel any kind of animosity towards that client, if you feel upset about the job that you have to do every single day, you're not going to do that job well, and you're not going to want to do that job. And that cascades down to your employees and contractors. They're going to not feel good about the client. They're not going to feel good about their work, and they're not going to feel good about coming in to work. So realistically, Find that way to create relationships and bond with your clients and, and have the opportunity to talk to them about everything, not just the, the problem that they're trying to solve with technology, but talk to them about what they're doing this weekend, what they're hanging out, what their, their hopes and dreams are for their jobs. Helping them accomplish those goals is just as important as the, the problem immediately, immediately in front of you. Um, also for better pizza, I think this is close to the Papa John's thing, better relationships, better transparency, better pizza. If you get a frozen pizza, you can put it on the grill and it's like five times better. Just want y'all to know that. It's just a random tip. Yeah, just a random tip. I'm full of those. Thank you all so much. I appreciate you being here.